So hello, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to our panel discussion today that's titled Roles and Relationships, Ethical Considerations to Involving Children and Parents in Patient-Oriented Research. Uh, my name is Pierre. I am the training coordinator for the Child Bright Network, and we're really excited to showcase this wonderful panel that we have assembled to discuss some really interesting topics that we should give some more consideration to. However, before we get started, there were just uh, a, a few quick housekeeping items that I was hoping to, to cover. And then once uh, we get through that, we'll introduce the panelists and get things started. All right, so um, I'm sure by, by now everyone is quite accustomed to using Zoom. Uh, we just ask that during the session uh, that you uh, mute yourself just to cut down on some unnecessary background noise. And of course, you can talk about off when you want to relay any input through your mic. And additionally, unless you are a panelist, we ask that you deactivate your webcam just to improve the, the quality of the stream and to cut down on any excess of bandwidth usage that we might, that we might experience. Uh, additionally, once um, we get to the panel discussion, if you wanted to uh, enhance your, your, your viewing on the session, uh, you might want to just activate to the uh, or enable the active speaker view. And to do that on your menu, on your screen right now, just click on the speaker view menu item you see. And then from there, just toggle on the speaker view. And then that way you, you won't see all of the uh, all the audience members. You'll just focus on whoever is actively uh, actively presenting at that time. Uh, the way the session is structured today, after the, the panel discussion, we will make time for uh, about a 30-minute Q&A period where you can engage with the panelists as well as the moderator. And to accommodate this, we sort of have two options here. Uh, one would be for you to activate or relay your input through the chat feature. And for that, just click on the, the, the chat bubble uh, function on your taskbar. And through there, uh, you can just input your, your query or your, your comments. But we just ask that you please uh, make sure you select everyone uh, so we can make sure uh, we involve the, the entire audience in the discussion. Uh, secondly, uh, if you wanted to relay your input over your, your microphone, by toggling you, your raise hand feature, uh, we will be able to then systematically go through the list and uh, call on you to then unmute your mic and, and interact with the, the group that way. And of course, once, uh, we, once we have answered your question or once your question has been, uh, has been addressed, just make sure to toggle that off or keep it on if you have another uh, follow-up question to, to get through. All right, so with all of that, it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, today to the moderator of our session, uh, Jennifer Johannesson. Jennifer is a writer and speaker on issues in healthcare, and is especially interested in looking at patient partnership through uh, a critical lens in the realm of both research projects and organizations. She was a longtime engaged patient in the role of a caregiver to her son, Owen, who had multiple severe disabilities all his life. Owen died 10 years ago at the age of 12. She recently completed a master's in bioethics and is currently co-producer and co-host of the Matters of Engagement podcast. And if you have not had a chance to, uh, to visit her, her podcast or listen to her podcast, I highly would encourage you. Um, and we'll certainly share the link with you if you were interested later on. So with that said, Jennifer, I'm going to hand the podium over to you and uh, we can get things started. Super, thank you, Pierre. Um, do you mind actually, I know we have the panelists uh, slide up, but we could maybe take that down because I'm going to, uh, um, it, it might be better to just have all our, all our faces up. Thank you. I think of Pierre as our uh, man behind the curtain. So if you have any questions throughout, uh, please shoot him a message. And, you know, honestly, if you see me typing, I'm probably asking him a question too. So um, yeah, so our session is called Ethical Considerations Related to Involving Children and Parents in Patient-Oriented Research. And, uh, you know, just to establish a common understanding, according to CIHR, patient-oriented research is about engaging patients, their caregivers, and families as partners in the research process. And this engagement helps to ensure that studies focus on patient-identified priorities, which ultimately leads to better patient outcomes. Now, practically, this means that patients, families, and caregivers are contributing to the development of things like research questions, designing forms and questionnaires, participating in data collection, uh, maybe conducting interviews, doing qualitative analysis, um, helping determine what outcomes ought to be measured, and assisting with interpretation of findings, and so much more. So, all of this is said to lead to health research with better results, higher impact, and more relevance for patients. 
So as we all know, this is a significant shift in roles for patients. Originally uh, only thought of as subjects or participants, um, now we see patients as active partners in research. So this session here isn't to debate the ins and outs of these activities or to ponder whether these are appropriate activities or not. In this session, we're looking at this shift in role through an ethics lens. Now, this encompasses a few ideas. And as we were developing this session, we realized that there were so many angles to be looking at. Um, so we can certainly think about ethical issues that arise when shifting the role of patients. But we can also think about the impact this has on formal ethics review processes. And we can also think about patient involvement in ethics review um, and others too, which hopefully will, or I'm sure will emerge as we're talking. So there's a lot of angles to consider um, and we should be able to sort this all out in an hour, right? <laughs> um, so I actually do have a full list of discussion points to help guide our conversation. And uh, when we distributed it, it amongst the panelists, uh, one of the panelists, you know who you are, uh, noted that we could probably do a whole week on just one of these questions. And that's certainly true. So let's just think of this as a starting point, um, a way to find some footing, maybe common understanding about what some of the issues are and maybe create a foundation for further discussion. Um, and also in you know, true engagement fashion, uh, find out <clears throat> what people want to talk about. So uh, we're really looking forward to hearing from uh, the listeners uh, to participate in some of this conversation. So that brings us to our panelists. Now, they're so thoughtful and bring so much experience and expertise. I think you'll really enjoy hearing from them. Um, as the discussion unfolds and hopefully what they talk about and what we talk about amongst ourselves triggers some ideas and questions from, from um, listeners. So if there's something that emerges for you as we're talking, please do go ahead and submit some of those questions or comments along the way um, so that you don't lose the thought. Um, and Pierre, if, uh, if you can just hold them until the Q&A and then we can, we can put them in the queue and, and see if we've addressed them or not. So uh, in terms of process here, I'm going to introduce our panelists all at once. So I'll go through and, and introduce them so you get a sense of the depth and breadth of the knowledge that's assembled here before you. Um, and then I'm going to go through and ask each of them a question one at a time. And we're going to hear from each of them and do that in a serial fashion. We definitely want to get a discussion going, but for this first round of questions, um, we'll just take turns. So for the panelists, please keep in mind that this round, when I get to you, is meant to give us a bit of background to establish some themes that we can talk about and help everyone get on the same page. So don't feel like you have to say everything all at once. We're, um, we're just kind of establishing some, some common ground. So do say as much or as little as you care to, but try to keep it in three to five minutes. <laughs> and I may interject with a quick follow on question uh, before moving on to the next person. So just to establish that. And once we've heard from everyone, we can move into more of a discussion. So our panelists, um, if you like, maybe give a nod or a wave when I mention you. So we'll start with Elizabeth Stevenson. She's a professor of pediatrics at the University of Toronto and the section head of cardiac electrophysiology at the Hospital for Sick Children. Her research focus on electrophysiology has led to clinical investigations in cardiac resynchronization and implantable defibrillator therapies. Additionally, uh, she serves as the chair of the Sick Kids Research Ethics Board. Hi, Elizabeth. So we have uh, Franco next. Franco Carnavale is a nurse, psychologist, and clinical ethicist with research interests in pediatric ethics. In addition to a number of academic appointments at McGill, he is the founder and principal investigator for VOICE, which stands for Views on Interdisciplinary Childhood Ethics, to advance knowledge and practices relating to ethical concerns in childhood. And Jillian. Jillian Backlin is a technical writer, an active member of Child Bright's National Youth Advisory Panel, and a patient and family ambassador liaison at the Sunny Hill Health Center at BC Children's Hospital. And Terry Lacaz is a child health wellness researcher. He's a professor of pediatrics at the University of Calgary and is the section head of neonatology at the Cummings School of Medicine. Additionally, he serves as the scientific director of MyCERN, which is the Maternal Infant Child Youth Research Network, and is a co-principal investigator on the CHEER initiative, which stands for Canadian Collaboration for Child Health, colon, efficiency and excellence in the ethics review of research. 
<laughs> I love all these acronyms, which aims to streamline and improve the research ethics review process to enhance and expedite child health research across Canada. There will be a test after if everyone's taking notes. And then uh, last and certainly not least, Antonia Palmer. Uh, Antonia is actively involved in the realm of pediatric oncology. In addition to being the co-founder of the Advocacy for Canadian Childhood Oncology Research Network, you don't get an acronym, I guess, uh, she founded Neuroblastoma Canada and is a board member for Childhood Cancer Canada. She also chairs the Patient and Family Advisory Committee of the CHEER Initiative. So there, we have all our panelists. Allow me to take a sip of water after all of that. Okay, so we're starting with Elizabeth. Um, as chair of the Sick Kids Research Ethic Board, Ethics Board, perhaps you could outline briefly for us what it is an REB does, what it oversees, and at what point does it get involved in a research process? Um, and this might be jumping the gun a little bit, Elizabeth, but um, if you would like to uh, include some thoughts on the extent to which REBs think about patient partnership or uh, incorporate patient partnership in what you do. Absolutely. So I'll hand it to you. Absolutely. So uh, just start to with thanking you for uh, for hosting us today. I think it's a really important discussion. So I'm really pleased to be a part of it. Um, to give a bit of an overview for people who might not be as familiar with research ethics work, um, uh, research ethics boards uh, exist at um, uh, pretty much every uh, Canadian institution that does research and uh, both with social sciences and uh, the medical sciences. Um, and uh, we are an independent body uh, at these institutions that um, review research and uh, make sure that it is moving forward in the most ethical way possible. Uh, our primary goal is around protection of participants, make sure that um, people understand exactly you know, what they're agreeing to and that what they're being asked to do is uh, is a reasonable and, and ethical thing. We also consider the ethics of the community at large. Um, one of the things that we would look at in a given research project, for example, would be whether or not um, the research appears to have uh, bias in it, whether that's uh, you know, racial bias, something we've been talking a lot about in research lately, or gender bias or uh, population bias, for example, by only including or only excluding certain populations. So beyond the proposed participants in, in research, we also looked at who else maybe should have been included that, that wasn't. The primary principles around research ethics are um, uh, very old, go back to uh, around the turn of the century when uh, experimentation in uh, smallpox on unwitting um, individuals who you can't call volunteers, um, uh, typically very impoverished people uh, uh, in smallpox and in also in yellow fever led to, uh, to infection and indeed death in some of those people. Uh, and that was one of the first times around the turn of the century that it was recognized that, um, that it was important to have an independent group evaluating. Over time that evolved through the Nuremberg trials after World War II and, uh, and our modern framework is uh, research ethics boards, or uh, in the United States, they're called uh, uh, institutional review boards or IRBs. In, in Europe, they tend to be called ethics committees, but the, the rules around which we operate are actually very similar for all of the groups. Um, we, there are international guidelines that help guide exactly what is the uh, sort of within the wheelhouse of the research ethics board. We look to make sure that the research is um, based on informed consent as one of the sort of fundamental principles, um, certainly for, for any direct participant um, research, uh, that, uh, that there is justice and uh, beneficence, saying that it is being done for good reasons, that it's founded in good science, um, that it's adequately funded so that the research can actually be completed in the way that it's been uh, been proposed, and that ultimately it's serving a, a public good. One of the major principles is looking at the risk-benefit uh, ratio for any 
individual participant and also for society at large. So you may have a very high risk trial that is being done in a very high risk population. Take, for example, a chemotherapy trial in a cancer that is otherwise fatal. We typically would be willing to accept uh, some risk on behalf of the participants uh, because uh, right now there is no better options for them. On the other hand, if you look at a very low risk illness, you would never accept a high risk research framework. So that's that's a balance that always goes on. I think there's been a wonderful evolution towards more involvement of, uh, of patients and, and families I'm in the uh, research development and also in the uh, research ethics evaluation. So one of the things that the uh, Canadian standards require on any REB is that you have someone participating who is a member of the community. And community is really not defined very well. So it's up to REBs to determine you who they think that is. If you have a research ethics board that that uh, studies a particular disease or a, a particular um, uh, social science area, you, you want to have somebody who might be affected by that. At SickKids, what we've done um, is tried to have on each of our boards, and we have, we have two, two boards, uh, each of our boards would try to have a family representative, uh, and we also try to have a patient representative who's usually a, uh, uh, a young adult who's just finished their, uh, their time at SickKids, but, but ideally quite close to the patient experience. Um, it's important to me also to have um, uh, non-patient parent representatives, uh, if we can, because we, we spend a lot of time uh, inviting well kids into our research uh, as well. So I think that the, the framework of the well child, as well as the, the framework of the child who has been experiencing an illness uh, is, is important. So all of those steps uh, look to try to make sure that we're bringing the patient uh, perspective into the evaluation. Perfect. Thank you. That was a, a good overview. Um, we're, it's going to feel like we're skipping around a little bit, but, but bear with us. Uh, so we're going to shift over to Franco next, our resident clinical ethicist. Now, um, before you start, Franco, um, you know, in my own mind, I think of REBs and what Elizabeth was just going through as uh, ethics oversight with a capital E. You know, there are frameworks and there are rules and there are established ways of thinking about ethics. But I think of your work um, as including what I often think of as ethics with a small e, where we confront or address questions that are perhaps more relational or principles-based, um, and they're often emergent. You know, there are things that kind of come up as, as we go along. Um, and people may experience these small e ethical issues as being in conflict or in tension with how our system is set up to operate. So it, it gets complicated. And we're in this, in the context of this session, we're calling this kind of the gray zone of ethics. And, you know, where there's no manual to turn to and there's not necessarily an established um, set of rules that we're talking about. So I'm wondering, and you might frame this differently, but if you can give us a kind of a gray zone ethics 101, <laughs> what might we be missing if we're only focused on REB requirements when it comes to patient oriented research? And if you wanna turn that question a little bit, feel free to, but um, I'm looking to fill in some of the uh, small e ethics gaps here. Wow, um, well, there's, a, there's a lot of gray zones and I'm just so grateful that uh, Dr. Stevenson has really mapped out REBs, what they do, what the historical context is, because then that really sets up the, the scaffold we, uh, that we're working with. Uh, I, I, I like, uh, Jennifer, the way you've distinguished big E and small E ethics is not something we've exchanged before. I, I might just tweak that a little bit and sort of what you're referring to as big E ethics is what we might call deontological ethics, sort of formal norms, standards, and rules, the do's and the don'ts that may be uh, linked in law, that may be linked in, in widely accepted standards that define some very clear thresholds that have to be respected. Um, then as, for the, as we work with those, or as uh, young people and families navigate those, they encounter their own questions about good and bad, right or wrong, just unjust. And I think that more sort of lived experience in navigating right and wrong um, might be 
what I would refer to as a smaller E ethics, sort of the moral realm of everyday experiences involved in trying to uh, operationalize these big E standards. Um, so uh, that's why I think it's very important to have this kind of a discussion as we are here to really help to highlight where there are spaces within the agreed upon by consensus rules and norms and the do's and the don'ts where all of us are having to improvise, adapt, and really decide what is right and wrong with a particular community, a population, or a particular situation. Um, I want to just sort of throw out a couple of things that are uh, important. First of all, I want to, for my participation in this webinar, I'm going to use as a shorthand and for convenience the term young people to refer to what I would otherwise probably call children and youth, what some people might call legal minors. I don't want to define them only legally. So I'm, when I use the term young people, I'm referring to those, those groups. Um, it's very clear in Dr. Stevenson's presentation of REBs and the important place that they have in the historical trajectory is that they have been put in place and are serving an incredibly important societal role in ensuring safe, respectful uh, practices in the conduct of research. Because when we are conducting research, we are in fact using people. We are using people as a means for the ends of others. The idea here, except for people practicing, participating in clinical trials where they may di derive benefit as well, may or may not, um, the, the, the aim of a research study is to advance knowledge that can then be used to the benefit of others. And so that is always going to raise a potential risk of maltreatment and exploitation or commodification even of people when we are using them as means for the interests and benefits of others and therefore protections are necessary. So you've got that one layer of protection that's necessary. Now, when we're talking about young people, we've got a whole bunch of other layers of protection because young people have been widely recognized as, as vulnerable and we have actual as well as uh, potential risks of exploitation of their vulnerabilities in all kinds of ways. And so we have all kinds of additional measures both in research ethics as well as youth protection types of standards that ensure that young people are particularly protected. A very, very serious, I won't even call it a gray zone because I, 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 I think it's not, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing gray about it. A serious problem that results from all this protection is the risk of really uh, suppressing a real authentic recognition of the personhood of the people in question is that you can protect people so much that they become voiceless and um, really just become objects that others are making important decisions about. Within the field of childhood studies very broadly and the work that we're doing uh, within the field of childhood ethics, uh, we're trying to bring forth a greater and clearer recognition of young people as active moral agents who have particular aspirations, ethical concerns, and capacities to participate meaningfully in matters that affect them. Um, I mean, that we all recognize the UN Convention on Rights of the Child recognizes that young people have participation rights. Um, what happens is that many of us, and myself included, particularly those of us that have been sort of trained into the various professions, we've been trained according to developmental models that are seriously outdated because people doing work in child development right now don't buy into Piaget types of stages where you know every children are imagined as having sort of these universalized stages that characterize children as immature and incapable and sy sy systematically perpetuate an exclusion from meaningful participation where their voices are given due weight in all aspects of the production and the utilization of research, both in the identification of what needs to be known, what priority ought to be attributed to it, how ought we investigate this, who ought we recruit or invite to participate in this research, how do we analyze it, what do we foreground in the results that we generate, and what are respectful ways 
to mobilize the knowledge that has been generated. In the work that we've been doing, we've been taking a lot of guidance and inspiration from um, some of the more widely recognized standards that are uh, either in use or are required for research with indigenous communities, whereby there is a much clearer, there's a greater clarity of the ways in which um, we need to work in partnership with indigenous communities who need to have a say in how we identify priorities. Um, these are completely different populations. Sometimes they intersect. Sometimes we're doing work with indigenous young people. Um, so is that enough of a starting point? Because I could go on for a week. <laughs> And for the record, it was Franco that said we could talk for a week about each of these things. Sorry to out you like that. Um, yeah, no, that's perfect, Franco. And I just want to add one more quick question here. And you know, it's obvious that there's a lot of uh, thought and contemplation that goes into what you were just talking about, about the personhood of young people and their capacity to contribute um, to matters that are important to them. Could you reflect just very briefly on the uh, the, the in the uh, patient-oriented research aspect of it. So that the next layer up, where we're not just talking about um, the, not just, but the personhood of young people, but also their ability or capacity to contribute to how all of this is going to get considered in terms of their participation in research. Well, this, uh, sadly, this, that's why the importance of this webinar, that we are all over the place and trying to answer that question and that we don't have clearly, aside from sort of espoused patient, uh, patient engagement, patient participation is good, it's right, it should be, how it ought to be done, whether, for example, are we recruiting particularly from the population of interest in terms of being involved in co-designing co a particular study, co-conducting it, co-analyzing it, co-utilizing it, and we work with youth advisory panels that we submit proposals to. Um, John Bright has, uh, has such, such, a, such, a, such a body. Uh, how, what is the best way to do it? Um, I, I think a lot of people have developed a number of initiatives. I'm happy to describe some of the ones we're working with. Uh, Holland Blurview uh, does wonderful work in terms of uh, having structures for systematically uh, eliciting young people perspectives in research that is being done. Um, but uh, I won't pretend to sort of have a def the definitive answer on that um, because this is really a work in progress. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. And actually, we actually have a young person on our on our panel today, so we can switch over to Jillian. Um, so we have been talking, well, we, we did focus a bit on young people uh, here in this context, but generally speaking, you know, I mean, so far we've been talking about um, patient partnership more broadly, but of course, in the context of Child Bright and lots of other uh, places, um, there are young people in the role of patient partner. So. Um, Jillian, we were in our offline conversation uh, before this before this seminar. Um, you were mentioning that there is that you've experienced that there's a difference between um, young people being involved as patient partners versus the general population. That there are particular dynamics and concerns that may come up for young people when they're involved, especially if their own family members or caregivers are also involved in the same project. So, from your perspective, how is patient partnership different or maybe more complex when youth and families are actively involved together? Hi, I think it really comes down to just the different viewpoints that come from involving um, all parties. And what we really want is well, we want all perspectives, but when we're specifically looking for the um, patient or youth perspective, it can be hard to get that without the influence of others around, especially, especially when it comes to um, caregivers or parents. So I, I think there are um, a couple of scenarios I, I can imagine uh, when you when you mention this. So I can foresee that there certainly are differences of interests and contributions between young people and then families and caregivers. There, 
they have different interests, different concerns, perhaps. Right. But then we also have a scenario where a young person and their parent or their caregiver is also in in the same session or contributing in the same way, and then they maybe get conflated into having a, a single voice. Could you reflect on that a little bit? Yeah, so that gets really tricky. Um, like you said, it, it runs the risk of kind of merging into one voice instead of two very different voices with two very different perspectives. So I think that that's important to recognize is that I might have a different goal than um, somebody else. And that goes the same for, you know, people of the same family or caregivers. So being able to find a way where they're all heard, but their voices can be um, distinguished instead of just grouped together because I think that that can lead to a number of different biases and results. Yeah, thank you. And and it just occurs to me that it, not just, but I, it, it makes sense to me now that uh, youth panels would be separate from family and caregiver panels, or maybe there's a joint family panel, but uh, keeping, ha having your own space for young people to contribute and voice their ideas separately is, um, it sounds like a good idea. And especially when it comes to like research with um, brain-based disabilities, which is what Child Bright focuses on, is um, all the panelists in our youth um, panel have lived experience in brain-based disabilities. So for for someone who is outside of that, who doesn't have the lived experience to speak on behalf, doesn't quite, it definitely brings a different perspective that you wouldn't get um, with someone with a brain-based disability. Great, thank you, Jillian. Uh, let's park this uh, this particular theme for now. We're going to move on to Terry, but um, I've got lots of questions for you, so we'll come back. So Terry, uh, we've heard from Elizabeth about REBs and Franco about a more nuanced uh, consideration of ethics. And now, of course, Jillian about some of the issues that may arise when youth and families are participating either together or separately. So for you as a researcher and as co-PI for CHEER, I think um, you're well situated to think about some of these intersections about, about all of these uh, aspects. So I'm wondering, do you see a role for REBs in helping to ensure ethical conduct of patient-oriented research projects? And that might include what we could call terms of engagement, like recruitment, representativeness, compensation, how roles are assigned, you know, the activities of engagement. Could you imagine a role for REBs that's more involved than it is currently? Yeah, well, I, yes, certainly, I, I think so. Um, they, so there have been a lot of guidelines for researchers developed over the last years, and I'm thinking of uh, guidelines you know, issues by the SPORE support unit in BC. There are also uh, international, you know, groups in the US or in, in the UK that have developed guidelines for researchers. And they often mentioned, you know, the need for developing an engagement plan, you know, right from the beginning that delineates, you know, all the process and how you successfully engage patients in a patient-oriented research project and that's delineate you know the the role of engagement the trust uh, and and of course all the practical aspects from the beginning of the project to the knowledge and dissemination part uh, and they are very good you know teaching material for researchers the issue, of course, is how do we ensure that uh, this engagement plan is actually really happening? Uh, and there is no formal body to, you know, to ensure that this is happening. So for instance, uh, apart from the SPORE 
a network grant or SPORE project funded by CIHR where there is an expectation to have you know, a, a descriptions of the plan in the grant, but all of their projects funded by CIHR you know, don't require an explanation around the process uh, as for instance, they're required now today uh, to have a, a, a clear explanations how gender and sex is going to be taken in account at all phases of the projects. Uh, so the founder, CIH, apart from sport networks and sport projects, actually do not require any uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, at least at the minimum uh, descriptions of how patients are going to be engaged in the project. And of course, reviewers sitting on panel of CHR have absolutely no educations around that as well. So that might be one way of looking at whether, you know, the public money is distributed by CHR for a, a selection and review process. Maybe we would want to have CHR developing some guidelines for the review process to ensure. Now for ROB, I think there is a room and, you know, uh, I'm thinking of the uh, Involve uh, initiative in the UK that actually lists a few items that could be part of the ROB evaluations in regards to, uh, you know, um, process the patients have been engaged, ensuring, you know, a lack of conflict of interest, uh, ensuring that their participation is uh, uh, appropriately rewarded and that they are involved at each step. So that could be developed. I don't think it's actually exist formally, but it could be something we may want to do with the ROB members and share as part of the, the CHEER project. Um, yeah, so I think there is room for the ROB to uh, at least ensure that things, you know, have been fought and developed properly, uh, but that I'm not aware that such a checklist actually exists. So that's something that we could certainly involve in the, uh, the developments of education material as part of the CHEER project. Thank you, Terry. Um, and it, I think maybe Antonia is going to touch on this. We, we did speak about this, but I think some of the concern with that is thinking about at what point the REB becomes involved. And so there's lots that happens prior to that. So um, yeah, where where we start to think about um, organizing this kind of uh, engagement plan um, is an interesting question. So let's switch over to Antonia now. Now I know Antonia that you wear a number of hats <laughs> or could wear a number of hats in this conversation. Um, but for the moment, I'd like to draw on your experience, I guess, as the chair of the PFAC at CHEER. Maybe that's kind of the realm that we can talk right now. So um, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about how patient and family perspectives inform the ethics review process. And I guess to put it really bluntly, why that's important. Oh, sure. That's a great question. And uh, I also sit on the Ontario Cancer Research Ethics Board, OCREB, as a lay representative. Um, so I think it, probably mostly really speaking from that perspective for this question. Uh, but when a patient, a uh, caregiver, or a member of the public take on the role of a lay member for a research ethics board, they're really taking on a very critical role to in help ensure the ethical conduct of research. And this task is really, it's not insignificant. Uh, you know, so prior to taking on this role, lay members are required to complete the Tri-Council policy statement or the TCPS2 training course on the ethical conduct for research involving humans. And that's really to ensure the foundational knowledge of ethics and how, to, how that applies to research. So the, but the lay member also brings them, as Jillian mentioned, the, the lived experience. Um, so that potentially directly as a patient or caregiver uh, who are able to really deeply understand the impact of research and a clinical trial. Um, you know, and they, I think, also bring with them the voices of their community and the community of, that they are a part of and having that shared experience with other patients and families. So in REBs, uh, the lay member is responsible for reviewing every study. Uh, they pay particular attention to consent forms. However, in some cases, they do also examine research protocols, supporting documents. Um, 
but they, the lay member really highlights the deficiencies um, within participant facing documentation and work to ensure that that information is as clear as possible to uh, assist in the informed consent process. So they also provide critical insight into the demands and burdens on the patient uh, and factors which may create challenges for enrollment and even retention on a clinical trial. You know, the lay member can highlight important issues which participants and caregivers need to pay particular attention to. So for example, um, will a treatment at a young age create issues of fertility when they're older? And are there interventions that could be considered now? Will the treatment on one clinical trial mean that that will exclude them from possible enrollment on another clinical trial? You know, if are they are in a clinical trial, are patients bank stem cells or tumor samples or other samples being utilized that'll and, and completely utilized that'll make it uh, impossible to enroll in other clinical trials in the future? You know, and what are the demands on patients and caregivers? Uh, the number of visits required, especially for those patients and families who must travel for treatment, even if it's within an hour or two or, or more within their own province. You know, it's highlighting uh, rationale for using placebo or whether there's an, whether there's an appropriate uh, pediatric formulation for, um, for the actual medication. Is it a liquid, a dissolvable tablet? You know, these are all issues that the lay member can really highlight um, both for the REB members as they're reviewing a study, um, but making sure that those inf that information is really highlighted within any sort of patient-facing materials. You know, I think another important role of the lay member is that they educate the other members of the REB on the needs of the patient. Uh, they ground the conversation and help to refocus it on the needs of the patient and no, on not only on the needs of the science. So as a lay member for REB, uh, for OCREB, I joined this research ethics board uh, when they were only reviewing clinical trials for adults with cancer uh, and came on and then was able to see the, the transformation and the evolution of that REB to review uh, protocols for children with cancer. And it was really the role of the lay member in particular that helped educate the more adult focused members of the REB to the differences and the intricacies of research and clinical trial design for small patient populations in particular. So I think there is the role is really, um, it is about that refocus, is, is about education, and it is about making sure the needs of the patient are being considered at the heart of all conversations. When, one of the things I just picked up on, Antonia, that you were saying was, um, you, you talked about adult focused versus small patient focused. And I, I assume you mean young people when you say that? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. So yeah. Um, where where I have a question, and I, and I can open this up to everybody or Antonia, feel free to answer, is where would uh, youth, youth patient partners fit into an REB process like that? I mean, it, you say lay people, and it is a lay uh, perspective, but it's also highly technical. Um, there's a lot of advanced knowledge that's required. You mentioned some training that's involved. And so um, maybe let's work out a little bit where a youth patient partner would have input into an REB process like that. I so don't I, I don't, uh, Elizabeth ahead. might want to take that one first, um, but I certainly would uh, could chime in after. I'd be I'd be happy to. Um, so I think it can be challenging, you know, just uh, just as you've said that some of the complexity of this um, may be beyond some of the younger children um, who are going to be involved in the in the studies, um, and that's why for formal membership, you know, a, a voting position in the in the REB, we've looked to engage young adults who hopefully still have some of that perspective and maybe memories of their uh, time uh, at Fit Kids, but aren't necessarily um, going to be uh, overwhelmed by the dense reading materials that are that are required. Um, 
uh, we do also have uh, a research and family advisory committee, um, which does uh, have, uh, and then we have a um, uh, a group that is uh, really made up just of kids, current patient um, or recent patient, but 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 kids, um, and those are both two forums that you can bring your research to um, in the pre REB phase and the in the kind of developmental phase in order to get uh, buy-in, to get feedback, um, uh, to uh, get an, an opinion on how this is going to read in the adolescent clinic or, um, you know, if you have a group of school-aged kids in our epilepsy classroom, you know, how's that environment going to be for this kind of interaction? So I think that doesn't necessarily happen formally on the REB um, because I think that the the requirements uh, would be would be very challenging for for most um, uh, young people, but uh, for um, but but that voice is very important. So we've looked for other ways to try to bring it into the research development process, um, and there are absolutely some uh, older teens who would be more than capable of this. The problem then becomes logistical. Um, even even for our university students, um, it can be a real challenge. You know, we meet Friday mornings. They have class. They have school. They have homework. Um, it, it's a, and it's a pretty big time commitment every every month. Um, so I think that that looking for non REB avenues is probably going to be a more a more successful way to get those younger people involved. Um, I'm actually looking at Franco. I'm wondering if you have something to um, add here. I'm going to come back to you, Antonia, see if you wanted to follow up on that, because I know I started with you. But Franco, I know we, um, you know, we've talked in the past and you alluded earlier to, um, you know, there are ways, there are ways to include young people's voices that may be, um, you know, kind of beyond the, beyond the formal structures. I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit. Sure, well, and I, you know, I really appreciate this exchange to look at different ways everybody's uh, approaching this. Um, our, our team, our voice uh, research program is really focused on not only on research ethics, but it's actually primary mission is ethics research. So we're doing research on various kinds of ethical concerns relating to young people in different ways. So we're trying really, really hard to look at what kinds of inventive, progressive um, strategies we can try out and evaluate. So because we're trying to innovate ways in which we could try to address some of these things. And I think everything that's been described sounds like you know, really great. And if we did all of that on a consistent basis, we would already be so much further along. And I think we need to look at how to make these much more explicit requirements. For example, that every proposal is brought forth, maybe either um, for example, might have been, would have some kind of a letter of attestation or review provided by a youth advisory council. So we do that sometimes. Um, but what we're really, really trying to do something innovative is looking at how to integrate ongoing youth advisory or even direction in the conduct of a study. So uh, just beyond the the way in which we set up the study to make sure that it's really uh, optimally attentive and respectful of research ethics standards that we need to uh, that we need to uh, ensure. Um, what we're trying to do is looking at so, for example, in one study where we looked at um, school-aged children's experiences within a, a child mental health uh, unit, uh, there were particular practices there that we were concerned about we uh, were able to invite a small group of young children, like eight years old to 10 years old, to form a small project advisory committee, whereby we were continually discussing them through the course of the study. Um, you know, if we could practice our interview with them, get some feedback from them on the way to do it, um, what they liked, what they didn't like, how can we do it a better way, uh, and also uh, meet with them on a regular basis on some of our provisional results and our interpretations and our understandings to get their input on um, the directions we're taking this, trying to be mindful of ensuring that the knowledge we generate is, is going to be respectful for them. 
in another study where we're looking at young people's perspectives on medical assistance in dying and the potential of um, expanding legal standards to mature minors. Um, we have a study that's actually being conducted by, he was 19 at the time the project started, just because we really wanted to, so he wasn't, he was at the age of majority, but fairly young. And he's actually taking the lead research role in terms of uh, worked with us, in terms of us having some more advanced methodological expertise, but he really took the lead in defining the kinds of questions with peers that we need to be look, looking at. He's leading focus groups, leading the research, working with sort of the old faculty people in terms of techniques and methods on how to, how to analyze things. Um, he's presenting at conferences some of the preliminary findings. So there are different kinds of engagement, different types of roles that, you know, look at how can we really stretch our understanding of sort of the authentic recognition of young people as uh, engaged, interested um, researchers or, or in the research process. Well, I liked, Franco, that last example you gave, because as you were talking earlier, I was thinking, you know, it's a pretty fuzzy line in some cases between what we would think about as partnership versus assembling a focus group to get ideas and take away ideas, you know, so it's, um, it, sometimes I hear about projects and I think, how, how, how what, what, at what point does this cross over into partnership? And so when you talked about this young person being a co-investigator and presenting findings and being part of the, um, the, the synthesis and the meaning making of what's happening, that shifts things. I mean, that, that to me feels uh, more in the realm of partnership versus just assembling people and see what they think and then take that away where it's processed outside of that. Um, I'm realizing, of course, we have Jillian here. <laughs> Why don't I, I'd like, I'd love to ask you, I'm sure you have some ideas here about what we're talking about. I mean, we've kind of covered, covered a wide range of things about how to think about young people. And um, I'm wondering what you're thinking about uh, what's been said so far. So in terms of um, young people uh, co or I guess self-determining to some degree how they're going to be involved in a research project. Yeah, um, so I mean, I can speak from my experience about how it was for me um, becoming a panelist and what that kind of uh, what that kind of meant for me. Um, I think growing up in the healthcare sort of world where I had to learn um, about, you know, managing my own care and also how to advocate for myself. It was sort of a natural um, step for me to find some place where, where I can continue to do that, but on, on a bigger um, scale. So not just for me, but maybe, um, for, you know, for future uh, research or um, whatever. I really felt like that was something I wanted to be involved in because with my um, lived experience, I could maybe bring um, a different lens on it. So I think that viewing um, this as um, a partnership instead of like a, um, a subject, um, I think brings another level of um, humanity to to people like me and their experience because they're not only just taking um, my thoughts and ideas, but I'm collaborating with, with them instead. So I think that's a really important distinction to make. And I think it makes all the difference in how um, people like me would want to be involved because they're actually being recognized as a um, crucial part of the process. I don't know if that makes sense. 
Yeah, thank you, Jillian. And you know, I it, it so I'll just put out one more broad question, and then I think I'll ask Pierre uh, if there's if there's been any input from uh, the audience. But let me just put this out here for uh, for consideration. Um, so it sounds like Jillian, what you were just describing is that you know there are, I guess, ideal ways or better ways to be engaging with people in general, with youth in particular, young people in particular. Um, but it's often left to each individual research or each individual project to kind of figure it out. And that's part of what we're talking about here. So the question to the group is, um, is there a need for oversight? Is there a need for something beyond just guidelines that people are um, asked to follow? Is there a need for an an REB type entity or an REB to be doing follow up to be tracking things or that there be reporting specifically on partnership practices. I'll stop talking. <laughs> if anybody has something to offer there, I'm, I'm very curious. And maybe it is about setting up the right foundations. Um, and I think that is a really important thing uh, right away. Because so I mean, in terms of patient partnerships, like REB approval isn't typically required for patient partnerships. Um, you know, it, but I think so, but when a patient partner acts as a member of a research team, they have to conduct their activities in accordance with ethical policies and standards. You know, they have to abide by the same requirements as the whole research team. So I think in that, it's about setting up that right foundation to ensure that everybody has that ethical understanding of how to move forward and move forward together and use that common language. Because um, I think without that foundation, then a lot can fall apart. And maybe that's where um, something like the TCPS2 core training comes into play um, in making sure that patient partners, and they're not necessarily like this is outside of being an REB member, but if a, it's a patient partner involved on a project, um, doing that type of training to, under, to make sure that they understand ethical issues in research and how to serve their community community ethically. You know, I think that the core principles of the TCPS2 are really important ones that teams need to abide by, the respect for persons, the concern for welfare, and, and issues around justice. You know, and I think these, if the entire research team has that foundation and has that training, they can act on those three pillars to move the research forward um, and move them forward with potentially not with a formal oversight, but at least with a strong foundation. You know, and I think this is, these are all really important elements to the relationship between patient partners and the research team members. You know, it's about uh, creating an effective and positive ethical engagement between the two parties. Um, and that's all about issues of respect and concern and justice. And, uh, you know, it's about um, being a valued member of the research team, being a respected member of the research team, making sure that there is that multi-dimensional information sharing. Um, you know, I think far too often patient partners, their voices aren't heard in an equitable way, um, but it is about being able to create a, a solid understanding from the beginning of how these partnerships can move forward and how we do that in an ethical way. Thanks, Antonia. Does anybody want to follow up on anything there? Okay, so why don't we, I, I see that there's a couple of things in the chat. Um, Pierre, I, I'm not looking at it because I don't want to get distracted. <laughs> <laughs> could you could you pick one and uh, and let's 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 see what's what? Yeah, sure thing, Jennifer. Uh, just to remind everyone, if you wanted to input your question in the chat box, feel free to do so. Um, alternatively, you can always just raise your hand uh, and we can call on you to unmute your mic. Uh, yeah, so we have, a, we have a few questions uh, in the in the box. First one is from Carrie, and this is directed at at Jillian. So Jillian, the question is, what do you think is a good number of youth to have on a panel if it's just made up of youth members? Um, and I know this might be a bit different given the uh, Child Rights National Youth Advisory Panel, uh, but yeah, do you have any thoughts on, you know, what is a good number to have? I think that it's important to get a wide range of, of um, 
experiences and viewpoints, but not too much where uh, youth voices are getting overshadowed. Like if there's, so it's definitely a balance, I think. Um, but I would say probably five, seven would be good, maybe 10 at the most so that everyone has a chance um, to speak and say their part. Thanks, Jillian. I imagine, too, it's quite important to have skilled facilitation in these contexts, well, in any any sort of group group setting. Yeah. Oh, Carrie just said thanks so much, oh. Jillian. <laughs> Pierre, Wonderful. next. <laughs> Thank you, Jillian. Uh, so we have a question from Frank, and I gather it's directed to, to the entire panel. How can we use patient-oriented research principles and methods to identify what issues, uh, what issues or questions need to be prioritized in research? Um, and really what is getting at there is how can we make a difference upstream by uh, engaging with, with patient partners? Well, I, I may partially respond to that. I think that uh, I'm thinking of the example of Peter Peter Gill at Sick Kids, uh, who uh, was successful at CHR to get to grow to actually look at prioritization process engaging patients and family around topics of uh, or important topics for research uh, in in patients. So. Jill and others are leading an, uh, a pediatric inpatient research network, and uh, they were able to succeed at CIHR in getting, you know, a, a, a money to to develop a, a priority topics agenda with engaging patients and family. So maybe something that we could do is to advocate for CIHR to actually have a direct streamline of fundings to, you know, do those kind of exercise. Uh, following uh, patients oriented research you know paradigms so um yeah i guess that might be one one option but I, I i think it would be very important to advocate chr for having opportunity for doing this kind of work mm. thanks terry franco did you want to add to that yes yes i i think this is such a tricky question and an important one because when you think about the research process um, there's just so many factors involved so that, you know, a researcher may respond to a, a call where there's an opportunity to research in a particular area. So their priorities are being set from outside. Um, we have an idea about what the competition is going to be like, how it's going to be evaluated, the kinds of things that need to be in there to get the funding to be able to do the thing in the first place. And these things are happening with people writing up grants day and night, on the weekends, on the fly. People are reviewing it. It's just uh, so hard to do this part right. So one thing that I think would be helpful is a, a research team that is working with young people over an extended period of time has built within the structure of that team uh, a youth advisory group, council, however you want to call it, that is an ongoing sounding board whereby there's ongoing checking in on what ought to be the priorities and and populations and so on that we set as a program so that we're, uh, we're continually attuned to youth perspectives on um, you know, what, are, what are the prevailing concerns and which are the most important so that we can direct our energies a priori. So we're already oriented in advance on what those priorities could be. I guess the question then, Franco, goes to who who are those youth? Like, who are the people populating these panels that are then advising and people are assuming um, hold the keys to the answers, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, is there maybe room for a broader based kind of democratic question about how people contribute to these, to the developing these research questions where it's not only patient partners or people who have, you know, been, uh, kind of trained into these roles, but, um, you know, truly representative of the broader population's interest. Yeah, so for our team, we have first year undergraduate students as a general youth advisory to get at some of these questions in a general way, within which one 
emerged and is leading the study on medical systems and dying that I described before. But they don't substitute nor speak for you know, all indigenous youth perspectives, the experiences of young people with the various types of mental health, um, various types of chronic illnesses and so on. It's just really a bit of a broad agenda, but then you develop um, subgroups really, like, like the example I gave before with youth mental health, where you then zoom in on particular concerns. I mean, I, I think Jillian described very nicely that um, representation, you know, needs to be very closely tied to experiences. And, and the, the young people on our Youth Advisory Council, you know, you know, really are committed to not speaking on behalf of experiences that they don't feel connected with. So I think there's what I was just describing just before on how you set priorities is, is, a, is a broad panel that can help with that. But then, you know, if you're looking at say disability, like I, I personally went and met with the Youth Advisory Council's Hall and Blurview a number of times to, to really work out some specific questions and so on. So a bit of back and forth. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Franco. Um, and Tony, I think I saw you flag. Or am I wrong? <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> For in terms of the response to that question, or I think so. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I may have misunderstood. Um, about about uh, patient priorities, uh, patient oriented research principles uh, applying to developing research questions that are further upstream than uh, than the actual research project. Yeah, I think there's actually some interesting work that's happening within pediatric cancer right now, which is all about um, it's a, about establishing research priorities in the very early stages about what the patient populations would like to see as research that moves forward. Um, so it's in uh, it's it's actually it's a project which has just started recently, but it's um, it's one where we are going directly to the community to say, you know, what what is it that you would like researched? Um, what is it that you feel is is valuable in order to move forward on to look at from a scientific perspective and in a scientific way. Uh, and I think that um, this early stage involvement of, of the community and of patient partners is a real model for um, how to move forward. I think the earlier we involve um, patient partners uh, and whether that is from a caregiver perspective, like I approach this, um, or directly from a youth perspective, it's being able to bring those, uh, those ideas, those um, areas where they that community wants to see that area of focus but getting those perspectives in early um, in those very beginning stages i think far too often we see our youth groups and our patient partners coming in very late in the process when it comes to research um, and being a member of a research team um, but being able to come in early to be able to shape and and how research is going to move forward is a critical step for how we really push on patient-oriented research. Thanks, Antonio. Franco? Well, I think this specific discussion is pointing out something that I think is also unmapped territory, and that is where do parents fit in? Is that I have been working with groups and I've given talks on some of this, where I sometimes hear researchers or clinicians here, yes, let's just get straight to the patient and, and sort of seeing the parents as a kind of a sometimes in the way. Uh, and I would be very, very concerned about sort of having this oppositional view of young people and parents. And I think Jillian spoke to, you know, we have to be careful about not presuming that sort of parents or caregivers are speaking on behalf of young people living with different types of health uh, uh, experiences. Uh, but if we're talking about a minor, then parents actually have direct stakes, interests, and responsibilities as well. Although they shouldn't be conflated with those of the child, um, parental impacts and parental implications are also important, and that needs to be considered. And so whether you have a dual panel, one with, with parents and one with children, they don't need to necessarily be the parents of those children. Um, I, I find there too, this is unmapped territory and I don't think anybody's yet come up with a definitive way to do this. So let's just be very careful that 
as we recognize young people as active agents that we don't then displace the very important role and responsibilities parents have. And many times in, with, particularly with young people who communicate differently, parents may be crucial interlocutors or communicators or rep actual representatives of young people's experiences because they are otherwise very, very hard to, um, to understand or to elicit. Thanks, Franco. Um, Pierre, should we move on to another, another theme? Uh, sure thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we pick up pick it up again. Uh, but yeah, thanks. So we have a few more questions uh, that were submitted in in the chat box. Uh, the next one is from Maureen, and it's generally uh, applicable to, or just generally addressed uh, to the to the entire uh, panel members. Uh, so the question is, whose responsibility do you think it is to ensure that patient partners, be they young people or adults, act in an ethical way? Is it the principal investigator? The research ethics board, it sounds like it's a big responsibility for patients and could be a barrier to participation. Yeah, I could uh, start with that one. Um, uh, if, the, if the patient partner is acting as a member of the research team, uh, then it is the PI's responsibility to ensure that they're appropriately trained, uh, aware of what their ethical responsibilities and role is, uh, and to ensure that that actually happens. Um, the, in, in that way, the patient partners are going to be no different than any other member of the research team and the fundamental responsibility uh, does fall to the to the PI. Thank you. Um, this has a, it's maybe a slightly tangential, but this raises a question for me personally. So as the moderator, I get to ask the question. Um, I'm wondering um, if anybody sees, so, uh, so often, like I've been involved in research projects before where it was actually my own, um, my own clinician or past clinician who I've been working with on a particular project. And this relationship, although, you know, developed into a personal one, and now we're working interprofessionally on a research project with me as a patient partner, it feels like there's some complexity there that um, you know, I've heard from others, and this hasn't happened to me, but where there's a falling out or where there's a difficulty or tension in the project, that it can be very hard for the patient partner to repair that relationship, or they may just drop out and nobody follows up, or um, there may be a compromise in some way to how they then engage with the healthcare system in general. Like sometimes these are very uh, dramatic kinds of um, implications or consequences. And so I'm, I'm wondering if anybody has thoughts on, on that, like that strikes me as ethical, an, an ethical domain for sure, um, in terms of how these relationships carry out and um, a kind of conflict of interest perhaps, or something like that. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, anyone has a comment on that. Maybe I'll just start to say, I think it's incredibly important. Uh, and I, I think it's difficult. I think that the, you know, the, the traditional framework would say that the REB's role is to protect the participants. And in, in this framework, we're identifying a, a patient partner. So a different role, um, and it doesn't fall under the typical protections of the, of the REB. But I think that it is potentially quite a vulnerable position. There's, there's clearly a, a power dynamic there that needs to be to be recognized. And I actually think some of the framework that we use um, for participants may be may be helpful here. So for example, uh, we typically would not allow um, a, an investigator to be the person consenting their own patients. So if you know you're studying disease X and you also care for the patients in disease X, you're going to need to identify a different person who is going to be the face of the of the study and provide some some insulation uh, so that there isn't uh, too much coercion to become involved in the first place uh, and then uh, similarly so that that patient doctor um, uh, or other practitioner if it's not you know the traditional medical framework but that relationship uh, doesn't get damaged because if it does the only person who really gets hurt in that is the patient uh, and I think you you have to acknowledge that that power dynamic and try to put in 
some kind of a system when that direct relationship exists to protect the patient. I think it's a less of an issue if somebody isn't in the care or recently in the care uh, of the individual. Um, I think that the vulnerability uh, diminishes with, with time and, and with the strength of the care relationship. Um, but it's not something that I think is addressed at any formal level right now in terms of the potential conflict and coercion. I think it's really important. And, and okay, may, I, yeah. may I add that, uh, you know, it, we have a, f a few examples of uh, multi-site uh, patient-oriented research projects involving patient as partner that were reviewed by RB in a very different way when it pertains to exactly what uh, Elizabeth, you know, described. So not only we need to have, you know, some um, some guidelines for RB to actually how and whether first and if yes how they should, you know, ensure the uh, the autonomy and the lack of conflict of interest and all these things that we talk, but to have that done in a consistent way between RB, because that may happen is that you know different opinions and contradictory opinions could jeopardize or you know affect the, the the conditions of the project if there were different opinions. So we need to work around this issue of uh, consistency as well. Hmm. Thanks, Terry. Uh, Pierre, is there another another question? Uh, yes, we had a few more a few more pop up and, and it's great to see that the engagement. Uh, we have one really wonderful question from Carrie, um, and it's directed at Antonia, but Terry, I think you would be able to comment on it as well as part of that the chair initiative uh, that we had mentioned earlier. So the question is, how can we make allowances for those patient partners who are not doing this as a job, who are not clinically trained or trained in, in the realm of, you know, of research ethics? Uh, many of the trainings that um, they usually go through require quite a bit of train, uh, quite a bit of time, and large amount of education. Um, how can we partner with youth and those without higher education uh, to be partners in this regard? Well, I can go first with that, uh, but I think uh, I think this is a great question. I think Elizabeth actually did um, answer it a little bit, and that it is the responsibility of the PI in terms of the research project um, or the leader within whatever the initiative may be, but to ensure that the entire research team has the education and training necessary to be able to move forward with um, understanding how to interact together and to work with one another in an ethical way. Uh, I think it's exactly right that something like TCPS2 is um, geared towards a, a much higher level of, of comprehension. Um, and so I do think that it, if there is a patient advisory that that information needs to be provided to that group in such a way that, um, that it is understandable so that everybody is uh, in that same start place and foundation. Uh, you know, it's, we are, there are, are not really great examples um, of being able to provide uh, this type of training, especially to youth. Uh, I think this is a place where there's really great opportunity and, and potentially a place uh, for the work that's being done through the CHEER project. Um, there's, you know, it's, I think that this is an area of uh, whether it's training for patient partners or for lay representatives on REBs, um, which which, is, which does require a lot more work. I think it's, um, it's such an important piece, uh, whether it's the onboarding or the ongoing training um, in how that relationship evolves. I think it, it also speaks to the point Jennifer just made uh, about how when you come into the role of a patient partner, it's a very different relationship that you then have with your scientific partner. And as that relationship evolves, you need to figure out different ways of interacting with each other. It's a very different language that you're going to end up speaking with each other versus the one of when you were actually a patient. Um, so I think it's a great question and it's a place where need, it needs a lot of work, but hopefully something like the CHEER project will help to start to fill some of these voids. Terry, did you want to add to that? We're we're going to move on to one more question, but if did yeah, you want just, to? Yeah, I can. If you if you if you uh, if I can share my screen for just uh, one minute, um, 
and I hope everybody see the, the screen. Uh, so this is the descriptions, you know, in in one slide of the cheer project. And I just want to, so the project, it's a five years project that it's a- uh, uh, Terry, we're, we're not seeing oh. your, your slide anymore. And what about that? There, there that's go. good. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, five years project with the ultimate goal to uh, achieve a single ethics review for child health studies in Canada. And I just want to emphasize one of the four deliverables, the number three here with uh, a, a, a very strong emphasis on developing educational material for a researcher, for RAB members, but also for uh, patients and families and, and, and children, uh, uh, either, you know, a member of uh, uh, RAB uh, uh, committee or uh, being approached for participating to a, a project uh, as as a as a partner, and um, we are actually in the process to uh, determine you know how we are going to develop those uh, teaching materials and what kind of uh, priority teams are going to be uh, determined and selected for next year, and this is why I uh, really uh, engage everyone on this call, uh, whether you are. Uh, partner or interested in being engaged in patients-oriented projects to actually uh, complete um, a research project, a survey that uh, I am hoping to be able to send through the chat box. That's great. Thank you, Terry. So the, 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 uh, the, yeah. the survey is actually uh, you know, asking for input from uh, the communities and from uh, 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 patients and families, you know, how they want to be educated around those research, those ethical research issues. Uh, and then of course, using the, the result of the survey, we will be able to develop the appropriate material, we hope. So anyone on the call who is think that some, to bring something to that, please feel free to, uh, you know, response to this survey. Thank you. So Terry, yeah. I'm going to take take that answer as your preemptive answer to my next question. <laughs> um, we need to wrap up on time. Um, so uh, we have five more minutes left and uh, Dan, Dan has uh, proposed a question here. So from each of the panel members, what follow-up discussions would be desired from your perspective? So is there a follow-up a uh, theme or question that, you know, based on this conversation, you would love to see another panel discussion about. Um, if Does anyone want to volunteer a first answer and then I'll start pointing. <laughs> uh, okay, Franco, you go first. <laughs> um, I think when we talk about ethics, we always talk about what might be required as mandatory. And I think that fits with your biggie ethics at the beginning what would be optimal? And maybe that would be the smaller ethics, what we really consider the good. I think we've discussed a lot of really fascinating, exciting ideas and examples of ways in which everybody's doing things as we're aspiring towards doing things optimally. I'd like to see those be a little less optional and just exemplars of excellence and that we have a ways to look at which of these do we consider necessary that should be considered part of good research with young people across the board. Okay, thanks Franco. Jillian, how about you? What what uh, further conversations would you like to see? Um, I think just conversations regarding like um, one person mentioned here, the fact that some patient participants won't be able to um, speak for themselves for various reasons. So finding a way to get their point of view without it again being clouded by a parent or a caregiver. So finding a balance between that that's inclusive for all, um, all people that could provide very necessary uh, feedback. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And Elizabeth. 
So I think that the last subject that we've been talking about a little bit is the, the patient participation as, as research partner early on. Uh, there's, no, there's no system for evaluation or protection of that. The way that the REB functions, we get fully formed research. All of that has already happened by the time it comes to us. So we don't have a window into that. And, and I do think that there's both opportunity to improve research uh, uh, by making sure that those relationships are built in a strong way, but, but also a need to maybe Part, protect some of those patient partners from all of the consequences that we've that we've discussed, um, uh, and so I think that uh, trying to work on a system that would both empower patients but also protect them when they're research partners um, would would be uh, really a, a great step forward. Super, thank you, Antonia. I, I actually vote for all of the above so far, um, <laughs> but I couldn't agree more with Elizabeth in terms of the early, um, the early involvement of patient partners. And I think one thing that um, it's probably talked about quite a bit, but hasn't, it's kind of been, it went talked a little bit about, but is that T word, the tokenism word, um, and how do we address issues of tokenism? Um, I think especially around uh, the youth voice and um, making sure that we are integrating the youth voice. And I think it was Franco that said in, in just that authentic way in an authentic partnership. And I think that that authenticity for me is uh, probably one of the most important issues because that helps us to address those, the challenges that exist in, in patient partnership that is more centered around a tokenistic and surface-based approach rather than something that's deep and meaningful. Thanks, Antonia. And Terry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to silence you before. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's <laughs> if, okay. If you no. want to add, if you'd like no, to add I something, just, you've got room. I can add that there, there yeah. will, I think we are, you know, living in a kind of exciting times with uh, the CHEER project and also the uh, uh, patient-oriented research training platform that CHR is, uh, pushing with, uh, you know, a, a grant right now uh, out. So there will be opportunity for bring, bringing, you know, all the stakeholders together in the very near future to develop, you know, some framework and maybe guidelines that could be used by RB uh, with the input, you know, of uh, uh, Antonia's uh, Patients and Family Advisory Committee on the CHEER project and certainly uh, 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 you know, group of uh, of parents and 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 youth that would, would really want to be a part of that. So I think that there is an avenue now for uh, developing those kind of uh, uh, guidelines or recommendations for RB. But I'm also thinking back to the, you know, my comments, my initial comment about the founders and CIHR as well to have an education process around reviewing grants when patients, you know, have been engaged in terms of prioritizations and design, because we, we don't really do that as sit on so those committee and there is nothing for the reviewers and for the review process to take that in account. So. Perfect. Well, that's a, that's a perfect note to end on. Um, Pierre, is there anything, any, any housekeeping we need to do as we wrap up? I don't, I don't have any big, big speeches, so. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for, for moderating this wonderful session and for all of our panelists for sharing uh, their perspectives. And of course, all of you who stuck through uh, to the end, even though we're slightly over time. Um, so just one thing I wanted to, I guess, uh, share with everyone is after the session wraps up, we'll uh, connect with uh, all of the audience members, send out the links that were shared and, and, and upload the video that you hopefully, uh, the recording of the session that hopefully you can share with any of your colleagues who may be interested. And just, I guess, one, uh, one more item we're hoping to have you uh, just um, uh, pay attention to is the evaluation feedback survey that we are hoping to send to the group. Uh, so feel free to uh, fill that out in the follow-up email we're, we'll send out and uh, we'll definitely invite your feedback on any sort of topics or, or, or themes that we should explore as we, as we go forward. And I'll be sure to uh, add that to you in the chat box as well if you wanted to uh, take a look at that right away. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. 
Hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of your day, your afternoon, and uh, hopefully everyone here can have a uh, socially distant yet uh, restorative uh, break over the upcoming holidays. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye -bye. Yeah.